Good Monday morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Bernadette Johnson. She is Vice President Strategic Analytics for Enverus Drilling Info. Bernadette is responsible for helping to grow and expand Enverus Analytics offerings. She joined the company through the acquisition of products and services from Ponderosa Advisors. With over 11 years experience in the energy industry, Bernadette has earned the reputation of industry expert with extensive experience providing crude natural gas and NGL fundamentals analysis and advisory services to various players in the North American and global energy markets. She is a regular commentator for and speaker to the energy industry. Her specific market expertise spans financial trading, production forecasts, demand forecasts by sector, infrastructure analysis, midstream analysis, value analysis and price forecasts. Welcome Bernadette Johnson. Thank you. All right, everyone. A little bit more about my background at Embarrass. I lead our macro fundamentals team. And so what we do is we are, we're tasked with, with predicting the market, what happens next and specifically around price, because that, that's really what drives investment um, success at the end of the day. So we are forecasting supply, we're forecasting demand, we're forecasting price, we're tracking things like the election and the impact that will have on the industry. Um, we also cover not just crude and natural gas and not natural gas liquids, but also power markets and other energy markets. And so our mandate is really everything energy and everything forward looking. So today I'm going to focus on the market and really focus on the oil and gas market. We're going to talk about um, our latest update from the, the OPEC plus numbers that came out late last week from the IEA. I'm going to show you our price forecasts. We're going to look at some of the risks to crude pricing and what that recovery will look like. And then, of course, we're going to talk about natural gas uh, and what's happening there with recent price bumps and what we expect to see going forward. So I'll hop right into the material. We've got about 35 minutes of, of content for you, and we will save some time at the end for questions. Um, so save those questions for us and we'll get those. Let's start with key takeaways. I like to start these presentations really uh, setting the stage for what you should expect to see next. Crude oil prices have staged an impressive recovery right after the deep production cuts, uh, managed cuts from OPEC plus and also shut-ins and other reductions you've seen from the US and other countries uh, and a partial recovery in demand. So we're, we're still early innings. So the, when I talk about this market, the way that I look at it is it's, if it's a baseball game, we're probably in the third inning. There's certainly some risk out there. We have a long way to go until you have a sustainable price recovery. Demand has started to recover, but it's nowhere near where it should be. And even the summer dry, driving season in the US was nowhere near where it should have been for a typical year. But it's not as bad as it was March, April timeframe, and certainly things are looking up. Um, a couple of risks for the crude market. Certainly it's it's supply and demand, right? It's it's what that timeline looks like for demand recovery. And then it's also things like OPEC compliance. Uh, does additional crude come back? Do we lose additional volume and actually accelerate um, the price recovery? And those are things we're gonna talk about here. Natural gas market remains bearish, right? So we're looking at about a $2.30 price, I think when I looked this morning. Uh, price is averaging under $2 in 2020 for the year, but there is some good news. The fact that we lost significant amount of natural gas production in the US as a result of um, crude shut-ins and less crude directed drilling means that we're very likely going to be short gas this winter. Today, we have plenty, we have plenty in storage, but once we get to this winter, it's a little different environment. And you, you've already seen that some of that price action start. A couple of weeks ago, prices moved 30 cents in a day. We're expecting that prices will be well above $3 this winter when winter shows up. And then natural gas liquids. Um, interesting things happening there because natural gas liquids are kind of stuck in the middle between natural gas and crude markets. Pricing typically is linked directly for ethane with natural gas and for propane plus for, with crude. And you've seen some interesting linkages and things break apart in the past few months because the pet chem markets actually remain pretty strong. And so those ethane prices remain pretty strong even in the face of, of collapsing natural gas and crude pricing. So let's get started with some of the content. Start with crude. So this is global supply and demand. And so this is the 100 million barrel a day market that you heard about before, before COVID and all of the, the demand destruction. So what you're seeing here is the dark line is supply. 
and the lighter line is demand. And the difference between the two are the green, the green bars. And so if you look to the 2Q 2020 number, what, what that looks like is about eight, nine, eight and a half million barrels a day oversupplied. So the market was oversupplied by eight and a half million barrels a day. Now that is not, is not bad. When you look at specific months in Q2, it got as bad as about 22, 23 million barrels oversupplied. So the fact that this is lower means there was very intense intentional supply management. You saw the OPEC cuts really take hold and you saw them make an impact and you saw compliance very strong. And so, yes, we were oversupplied in Q2, but not as bad as it could have been. Fast forward to today, Q3, we're undersupplied. Now, what does that mean? It means every single day we are pulling crude from stocks because we're not producing enough to meet demand. And so that's a good thing. And you see that undersupply exists all the way through Q4 of 2021. And, we, and that's what you really need to see. So when we model supply and demand, we're tracking both very closely. We're looking at global production. We're looking at projects that are underway. We're looking at things like Guyana and Suriname for the longer term time horizon. We're looking at some projects that were underway in the North Sea and certainly taking a deep dive into US supply and what that looks like. And so we model supply. We do the same thing for demand. So we're looking at jet fuel demand. And when we think that recovers, we're looking at petrochemical demand, which is about 20% of a barrel of oil globally. And then we're looking at the transportation piece. So the gasoline and the distillates. And so what you see there is, is the forecast that we see and that we expect the market to be undersupplied going through 2021 and really that time period being necessary so that we can pull that extra crude out of stocks get stocks, stock levels globally back to a, a reasonable level. And then you have a longer term price recovery. Now, if anything falls apart here, so if the resurgence of COVID around the world uh, causes some, some additional stay at home orders or quarantines or shelter in place, and you knock more demand off, you could flip that, right? Especially in the near term, that you could flip that undersupply to an oversupply, and then it's simply going to take time, more time for the markets to rebalance. So this is, this is not without risk, certainly, and we'll talk about some of those risks, but um, I think the, the better news here is that we are in recovery. We're early inning, so third inning, inning, call it. We are sitting at a price, WTI price around $42 today, and we do think that based on what we're seeing today, if there are no major wild cards that show up, that we are on pace for a significant price recovery by the end of next year. Let's talk a little bit about OPEC plus and compliance because this is this is a hot topic, right? And this is some of the some of the on the supply side maybe the main question around: uh, Will we continue to be able to pull from stocks, or will we see production bounce up a little bit too soon and cause um, the price recovery to take longer? So this data is for July. This data just came out. This is IEA data, and it just came out the end of last week. So you might have seen some articles already discussing it. So what we're showing you here is the baseline in that first numbered column, the agreed cut, the production target, and then the target versus July. And so if you look at the cut, it's still that high level because August is really the first month here where we've seen some of that production start to come back on based on those, those quotas that were negotiated for the second half of the year. The production target you see here, and then you've got the target versus those July numbers. So how compliant were these countries individually? And what you see here actually for the first time, if you did the, the percentage calculation, is that the, the plus countries, so Russia, Kazakhstan, et cetera, those countries were actually more compliant than OPEC was just in July. And so something to keep an eye on. Um, the good news is Saudi Arabia is still very compliant. Iraq has been consistently out of compliance, so that's really no surprise. Um, the UAE compliance number did drop to about 23%, and so that one is certainly one to keep an eye on. Um, the good news there, though, is that the UAE, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia were part of that, that Gulf state coalition that cut an additional 1.1 million barrels on top of this 9.6. So a little bit out of compliance for July is not, is not a, a super um, red flag, but certainly something to watch. In terms of overall compliance, we're showing you this chart going back to 2019, June. You see over 100% compliance. Then you see the price war early this year, the renegotiation of some of those cuts. So May at 89%, June at 107% compliance, and then July coming in at 90%. And so very overall, very high levels of compliance compared to what you might've seen with OPEC um, 
pre-2000s. What does this compliance look like over a longer period of time? And so again, mainly I put this in here to highlight the point that even back to 2017, since these negotiated cuts have been in place in some form or another, and at some level or another, what you see here is the red line is showing you that compliance percentage. And so that, if you look around that 100% line, we've, we've actually been very compliant. And there have been periods of time, like fall of 2018, where production did increase ahead of the next round of negotiations. So all those countries, majority of which wanted to be at high levels. So when they negotiated the next round of cuts that took, took effect early 2019, that the calculation was, was coming from a high level. Fast forward to September of 2019, you saw the Saudi facilities attacked. So the compliance went way up because Saudi Arabia production went way down for a period of time. And then most recently, of course, the trade wars. But over, overall, I think the bigger takeaway here is that OPEC plus has been very compliant over time. We would expect that to continue to be so, and especially following the trade war behavior that we saw earlier this year. Um, I think Saudi Arabia has signaled that they're not willing they're not willing to accept any kind of cheating or prolonged issues there. Um, Mexico is no longer part of the agreement. And so that did increase production by 100,000 or so in July. Uh, but that was, I think, largely to be expected. And otherwise, any countries that aren't in compliance or haven't been, um, Saudi Arabia has even been pushing for them to make up the crude that they should have cut. And so we should expect this to be very tightly managed. And we would expect that it, it's, you're going to see high compliance going forward. So not, not a huge risk here to to supply and then it changes dramatically. A couple of country production I pulled out just because we get a lot of questions on a handful of countries and Libya is one of them. Right? So if you're tracking what's going on in, in the country, um, you know that there's, there, there is um, civil unrest, there's lack of central leadership within the country, there's really two, two groups that are fighting internally. And what you've seen as a result is their crude production has come off dramatically in 2020. And so what you see here is they're down here around 100,000 barrels or so of production. Now, Libya is a little bit of a wild card. Um, Libya back in 2016, 2017, were part of the reason that the prices collapsed in the first place originally was because Libya showed up with a million barrels a day of supply that nobody thought they had. And so that, that short period of time that really pushed the market really long, um, that could happen again. And so all, a lot of eyes are on Libya and trying to figure out what happens in country? Do they broker another round of peace, which allows production to pick up, which would or could put more production back on the market? So this one is a risk that you see more supply and you slow down um, that stock correction. Venezuela, we get a lot of questions on Venezuela. If you look at this production down here, about 325,000 barrels a day, um, a far cry from where they were 2012, uh, about two and a half million barrels a day of production. And so this has fallen dramatically. We don't expect this to rebound. I think regardless of what happens politically in the country and leadership, whether it's Maduro or someone else, uh, when you look at what's happened with the infrastructure, it's, it's at a place now where most of the surface facilities have been looted for metals. So even if there was, there was a change in regime in, in, in the country and attempts or efforts to really right the economy and start growing again, the production piece would take at least probably a decade at this point to really to really recover from that. And so this is not something that we're expecting in the short term is going to change much. Um, but also, you don't have a lot of supply here that you could lose. So back 2016, 2017, 2018, part of what helped balance the market was the fact that Venezuelan production was coming down. And so today, that production is already at such a low level that this is not going to be an area where it really helps us balance the market um, with less supply. So something to keep an eye on. Iran, a lot, of, a lot of recent questions around Iran and what could happen if there is a change in administration, if there is a change to the nuclear agreement or a reviving of the nuclear agreement and relaxation of sanctions at some point. So I put this in here really just to highlight what is, what's the potential for Iranian production? Where was it sitting before the latest round of sanctions and where does it sit today? So before the latest round of sanctions, look at this 2016, 2017 area, sitting around 3.8 million barrels a day of production. Now this is a higher level than the market thought they could get to, right? The market last time 
when sanctions were being lifted said maybe 3.2, maybe 3.3, probably not 3.8, but they were able to do it and sustain it for a period of time. Latest round of sanctions hit uh, late 2018, you see that production come down dramatically. And today the official reported numbers under two, 2 million barrels a day. Now I will, I will caveat this and I will say that there very likely is Iranian barrels hitting the market through black market channels. And so this, this reported production, this official number is likely lower than what actual, actual production is hitting the market. Um, but in any event, this at least hopefully gives you a size of, of 1.6, 1.8 million barrels that could come back over a period of time if sanctions were lifted again and the country were able to resume production. So this is, this is definitely more risk that we see more supply uh, but it's not immediate, right? And a lot of it depends on what happens politically and specifically in the U.S. around sanctions and um, the nuclear deal. So, so this is one thing certainly the market is talking about when we think about uh, an election cycle that could put Biden ahead as the winner. All right, global crude and condensate. So if we roll this all up, what does this look like? I'm showing you non-OPEC on the top, that blue, and you see a lot of that dip is actually from the U.S. So that U.S. piece other countries as well, but the US piece is the bulk of that. And then of course you see OPEC down below. And so we've pulled a lot of supply out of the market, which is really what's what's an additional, in addition to the 9.6, 9.7 million barrels that OPEC cut for May and June, and then extended through July. In addition to that, you had the cuts and the shut-ins in the US, and then you had Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the Gulf states cut out another 1.1 million barrels. So we pulled way over 10 million barrels a day out of the market, which did help balance for the past few months. I think when you look ahead though, the tricky part here is how do you, what, what does the market do when we start trickling some of that production back in? How quickly can demand continue to recover? And then of course, all eyes on that OPEC plus compliance to see if anybody, if anybody starts cheating. All right, let's talk about US. So we're, we're gonna shift gears, we're gonna wrap up crude in a few minutes and talk about natural gas and natural gas liquids. So US crude. So this is our forecast. Uh, so you see historical back to 2014 and you see our forecast out through 2024. What you see here in that dotted green line here in the middle, and that's our estimate of shut-ins. And so compiling all the data that's available to us, whether it's um, press releases, state, product, state reported data, whatever it looks like, this is our estimate for what shut-ins looked like. So we went from about 12.8 million barrels in March, we cut a little bit under 10 million barrels uh, mid-year. And since then, a lot of that shut-in production has actually come back. And you see that reaffirmed in, the, in this latest round of earnings when operators are talking about it. That green line also shows you our prediction for what US supply does going forward. And so we would tell you that we continue to, to, to drop production from the rebound and shut-ins. We continue to drop from here. We get close to the 10 million barrel mark by mid-2021, and then we start growing again. And then we hit almost 14 million barrels by the end of 2024. And so this line is heavily dependent on our price forecast. And so I'm going to show you our price forecast in a few, in a few slides. But this is, this is based on our price view. This is also based on our understanding of U.S. supply. So we break the country up into 500 different slivers of production. We fit type curves. We normalize for lateral length and profit intensity. Um, we calculate break-even economics. And if basically, if you drill wells that are economic and you don't drill wells that are uneconomic at our price forecast, this is the production that you should expect to see. We also put some other forecasts on here just to highlight um, what would happen at different price scenarios. Uh, key price thresholds is another way to look at it. So at $40, we, we continue to drop, but then we hover right around, call it 10 and a half, 11 million barrels. At $50 per barrel, and this is WTI, then you see some recovery start pretty much immediately, but then it flattens out and it doesn't really quite reach um, 12 million barrels. And then at $30, which is that yellow, would see sustained drop in supply almost at a natural decline rate. And so this is, this is highlighting if, if, again, if wells that were drilled um, with $30 or under break even happened, that, that yellow line is what you're gonna see. And so that is also a big signal to us that you will see price recovery. Uh, no matter how you slice it, US production cannot continue to drop forever and continue to help meet global demand. And so $30 wasn't the right price. $40 isn't the right price because it keeps us too flat. 
um, $50 is probably a little too high in the near term, but then longer term is not enough to meet, to meet that demand again. And so that's, that's how to read this chart. All right, the rig count, oh, real quickly. The rig count, uh, we're hovering around 280 active rigs today. So if you look at our activerigcount.com um, data, you can see that every day. That rig count is supported by GPS units on the majority of rigs in the US. And so some of those rigs, that number is probably gonna come down a little bit, um, but those rigs definitely represent much lower level than the 433 count we saw last time the prices collapsed back in 2016. Um, and really it's, it's across every basin. Right, so the Permian here is the blue line, and you can see over half the active rigs in the country were drilling in the Permian before the price collapse. And so that, that count had to come down dramatically as well as every other major basin in the country. Our duck forecast. So if we look at this, uh, we're, we're predicting that we're gonna hit our, call it peak ducks in the US in Q4 of this year, and then it's gonna start tapering down. And so what's happening here is we're basically tracking rigs. We're tracking the wells that are being drilled. We're tracking frat crews. So one of our one some one of the new data sets that we are creating and that we're going to push out to the market in about three weeks is frat crew tracking. And so we're taking all these different data points, including um, satellite imagery, our GPS units on rigs, our cell telemetry data. We're we're bringing all these pieces together plus completion filings from the states, and we are basically estimating where frat crews are active. And so some of that work is, is embedded here. So we would tell you that with 280 rigs active, there's a little over 100 frat crews active out there right now. So they are completing some wells, but not, not the number of nearly the number of wells that we're drilling. So that means in the meantime, we're continuing to increase the duck count. And we expect it to hit almost 3,600 uh, by, by Q4 and then start to taper off. Um, the, another way to think of this is when we look at the global supply demand balance, we include this as a part of, of storage, right? These are ducks that are waiting to be brought on. And this for us is an extension of storage that is a piece of why we would tell you that US supply doesn't really start increasing again until mid next year. And prices don't truly recover until late 2021 into 2022. Uh, a piece of this is certainly the ducks and the number of wells that are just waiting um, to come online and represent significant additional supply. All right, crude oil exports by destination. So really this is just to highlight the some of the, the re recent latest data that you're getting um, exports out of the US. Exports dropped dramatically for a period of time. If you looked at the next data points here that we're starting to see with the weekly numbers, those exports have rebounded and not completely, but rebounded significantly, which is a large part of why crude markets and crude prices are $42 and not lower. And so a lot of eyes are on, on those exports. A lot of US uh, unconventional supply needs to be exported. We continue to bring in the heavy imports. We continue to push out the lights and, is, and we need a market for the lights. And that is a key part of, of really balancing the market and seeing price recovery. So every week when those uh, EIA numbers come out, this is certainly a, a, piece of, a piece of that reporting that we pay, pay pretty close attention to. All right, liquids demand. So let's talk about crude demand a little bit. So crude, not all crudes created equal. Every single barrel of crude creates a different list of slate of products and every single refinery in the US creates a different set of products. And so this is important because you have transportation demand, you've got petrochemical demand, you've got the air travel piece of transportation, and then you've got other things like distal fuel oil and, um, and other oils, right? So every barrel of crude, there's many markets that are represented there. And so this is showing you US liquids demand. So the, the top left one, finished gasoline, we're not back where we need to be. We've recovered significantly since the stay at home orders were, were largely lifted and people are moving around again, but we're not back where we should be. And we're certainly not back where we should be for peak summer driving season. So have we seen some recovery? Yes. Is everything resolved? No. So something to keep an eye on there. Jet fuel. Jet fuel had plummeted, stayed pretty flat. Recent numbers came up a little bit, but then it's pretty much plateaued again. So you're, you're still seeing trouble in the jet fuel. So this is it's a key piece of what's gonna keep that demand from coming back up and rebounding to, to historic levels. Distilled fuel oil is a little bit below where it should be. Other oils are a little bit below where they should be. And so net-net transportation fuels is about 70% of the barrel. And that's really where you're still seeing some of the issues. And so a, a lot of eyes are on there tracking it with the market. 
This also means that refineries are not running at full utilization. So I think the latest number was 79%. Last year at this time, we were running over 90%, close to 95%. So refineries are still not running uh, where they need to be, which is another strong sign that demand's not there yet. Uh, that refinery utilization, that's the one that I would point you to, to watch the closest, because basically when you think about price recovery uh, for crude, a big part of that is refining margins. Refineries are not gonna ramp up utilization if their refining margins are still pretty much nothing. And so that's unfortunately still kind of the environment that we're in. So this left chart here is showing you those monthly refining margins. And you can see five to $10, even up to 15, $17 by, for certain pads. Uh, demand destruction, COVID, price war, all of those things combined. What happened is these refinery margins really collapsed. And if you look at this, the latest dates, or the latest data points, we're still hovering right around zero. Pad two is the exception and it was recovering and then it's taken a few, a few weeks have actually um, gone the wrong direction and come back down a little bit. So refining margins for me is probably the, the first thing that I'm watching as an indication that the market is truly recovering. If you don't see refinery margins, you don't see refiners ramp up utilization, it means buyers are not out there in the market buying additional crude, it means crude prices have a really effective ceiling. And so refining margins, I can't reiterate this enough, is really, probably the first, the first thing that you should watch to really predict the next phase in recovery. All right, beyond 2021, what does this look like? So 20, 2020 on average, first half of the year was rough. We're average significant oversupply and that's gonna make that 2020 overall number look um, relatively high compared to recent years. 2021, then we're, this, at this point, we're, we're projecting a significant undersupply, which this is what we need to be able to pull that extra crude out of stocks and to balance the market and see a long-term sustainable price. I think from a, from a trading standpoint, you will not see a sustainable price recovery until you have storage back at a reasonable level. And so if you're looking at refiner margins, you should also be looking at stock numbers and then of course, OPEC compliance. Those are probably the three main things that I'm looking at um, day to day, week to week to predict the next phase in recovery. Looking forward, uh, 2022 at a slight undersupply, but that's, I mean, that's pretty close to balance at this point. And then 2023, 2024 in balance. So once we get to, once we get through 2021, I think everything starts to look a lot better. And really for me, I would tell you the risk is probably between now and about March of next year of 2021. When that, that next round of production starts coming back on from OPEC because of the cuts that they negotiated that are scheduled to be tapered down um, early next year, that January is going to be going to be tricky. I think if, if the price is going to collapse again back to the 30s, it's probably going to be a January time frame. So, so something certainly to watch. All right, and this is our price forecast. And so this is for crude. What we're showing you here is Q3. Uh, we have it around $35, so I, I do think there's a little bit of downside risk compared to where we're at today. Q4, uh, hovering right around $35, $37. Q1 of next year, bumping up to $40, $55 by early 2022 or late 2021, and then another price bump in 2024. And so again, this is what balances the market. This is the price strip based on our, understand, our understanding of U.S. supply, our predictions for demand, and our predictions for OPEC plus and other global supply. This is the price strip that would essentially balance the market, allow us to pull that extra crude out of stocks and to have a sustainable, a sustainable price recovery. All right, so I'm gonna jump through this real quick uh, because I do wanna talk about natural gas and natural gas liquids with our last few minutes. So natural gas, natural gas is interesting. Uh, this chart is really just showing you the bottom green we have flow data, right? So all of you that follow the natural gas markets, you know we have natural gas flow data and we can see that six nomination cycles every single day. So we have a ton of transparency in natural gas and that, that's the green. We can basically see meter by meter for the majority of, of, of supply, what's happening. Uh, where can we not see it? Interstate or intra, sorry, intrastate pipes. So think the pipes that are only in Texas, significant supply hits those pipes that we can't see because they're intrastate and they're not regulated by the FERC in the same way. So we can see a lot of supply. And then we know, we generally know what the gross up production should look like. And so we can model that pretty closely and we can model it day to day. We can track things like when you start seeing a lot of gas supply come off because of crude shut-ins, because of gas coming from those wells, 
we can see the impact of even those crude shut-ins pretty well. And so this is a data set that, that is pretty powerful. I would also say, if you look at the trend here, look at the May, um, May, June, towards the end of this chart, we lost a lot of supply for gas. So initially it was fine, right? Because gas prices collapsed in January of this year because we had way too much gas in storage. And gas prices, just like crude prices, will do whatever they need to do so that you don't blow through storage and also have enough storage ahead of the next winter or ahead of the next seasonal timeframe when you need it in the case of crude. And so this is interesting because we did, we had too much supply, then we lost a lot of supply and it actually kind of pushed us short. And so when, is, when does this dynamic start to materialize in the pricing? And we would tell you it starts as soon as this winter. So let's look at a little bit more of that. Um, June versus January production, we lost about seven BCF a day and it was spread out, um, but a lot of curtailments and even voluntary curtailments up in places like the Northeast where we saw almost 1.7 million, 1.7 BCF a day um, out of the market. In terms of break even, so if, if we're telling you a price correction is coming in natural gas, and if you're looking, you're, we're already trading above $3 in the December contract and then through the next winter, it's all about break evens, right? How high does the price have to be to bring on enough natural gas to meet the need and to balance the market? A lot of it comes down to break evens. And so what we're showing you here is at $40 WTI, what is, what is the gas break even? So to solve the gas break even, we have to assume a crude price. And so we're assuming $40 here. You can see at the, at the left side of the chart, you've got that associated gas. So that very cheap or kind of byproduct gas. Then you march up the curve and this is where it starts to get interesting. This is where basically whatever play here is on the margin will dictate what is that, what is that, that equilibrium price. You've got a lot of Haynes fill or you've got some Haynes fill that comes in right around 250. You've got another batch that comes in up here around 315, 325. Those two tranches of production are, are important for balancing the market. And so we would predict that you would need a higher price, a price high enough to bring them in. You also have Marcellus Hudica, a lot of it hovering down here in the $2 mark. You've got some Bakken, a little tiny bit of Bakken. You've got some Eagleford, you've got a little bit of DJ, uh, and then you've got some Anadarko. So you're gonna see uh, prices sufficiently high to bring on enough gas supply to balance the market. And we would tell you that's about 350. So 350 and under, we will need some incremental drilling in these areas to, to generate enough gas to meet that need. Um, what is that? This, this is our supply forecast. And so this is dry gas. And so what this is showing you is that red dotted line. That's what gas supply would have looked like with the CME forward curve at the end of June, right? And so the, the curves moved significantly since then. And this was too low, right? You weren't gonna have consistently declining gas production from the US through this time period. So we needed to have a price response and that's actually already started. And so we would tell you that this, the, the stacked colored areas, that's what gas supply needs to be to clear the market. And that, assuming, a 40, a, assuming our WTI price forecast, right? So 2021 averaging 43.75, 2022 at 55, 2024 at 60. The price you need to do that is 390 for Henry Hub in 2021 and then $3 2022 and beyond. And so this, this is basically our view of production. These are the prices that we're predicting you will need to, to, to basically generate this amount of production to clear the market. So we're expecting a higher price than what the forward curve would tell you right now for Henry Hub. Uh, but then again, settling back down at that $3 mark further out. All right, I'm gonna skip through this. This is Canadian imports, nothing major um, to see here. In terms of natural gas demand, um, there's some specific numbers in here for ResCom, industrial and power. We are predicting natural gas demand in the, in the US to increase over the next five years. Um, the exception here is power in 2021. That power number looks pretty low. Why? Because we're predicting a higher gas price, right? So if the gas price is high, that gas doesn't compete as well in the power generation stack. So you see a little bit of a hit to power demand. Uh, but then after that, gas prices come down to $3 and you start to see that recover again. Exports. So exports is certainly something to keep an eye on. Exports was the reason that prices moved 30 cents a couple weeks ago. We had the August 1st nominations in that pipeline flow data and they jumped up about a BCF a day. And so that was a strong signal that this drop we saw for LNG exports was starting to recover. And so we're already on the path for significant demand recovery here for natural gas. 
but I would definitely keep an eye on those nomination levels, keep an eye on those facilities. And if, if we start to see that behavior waver again, or we start to see cargoes being canceled, that would certainly represent some downside risk to gas pricing. And so on the gas side, this is the number that I would watch the closest. All right, Mexican exports, no major changes here, um, relatively flat seasonality certainly, but relatively flat. Now let's skip ahead to the price forecast. I showed you that it was 220 for 2020, 390 next year, and then $3 starting in 2022 and beyond. And again, this is based on our view of supply and demand and what it will take to balance those markets. It's also tied to the crude price. So if we're wrong about the crude price, we're gonna be wrong about the natural gas price. So keep that in mind. All right, NGLs, I'm gonna to skip to the price slide because I think this one is perhaps the most the most interesting one. Uh, if you look at this, the NGL prices for C3 plus, which is propane, butane, natural gasoline, they, they pretty well collapsed um, starting in April. And so what happened there is heavier NGLs are tied to crude, right? So the crude price collapsed. The natural gas price was already pretty low and ethane demand, the pet chems running ethane in the US actually continue to run around 90% full. So ethane did not take a hit. The C3 plus definitely took a hit. And what you see here is those prices collapsing as a result. Now we would tell you, uh, starting in, in 2021, we do expect some of those historical linkages to start to widen back out. The most risk here is probably on this natural gasoline, this top one, that that could, could hover low or closer to those butane numbers. Uh, but certainly some interesting things happening here on the NGL side. All right, my last minute or two, I'm gonna show you some greenhouse gas in, uh, information. So this is some of the new stuff that we're working on. I talked to you about the frac crew tracking that's coming out in a couple weeks. Um, we're also releasing an OptiFlow crude product, which is, it's, it's a product like our, like similar to gas flow, but it's really for crude. So we're running, we're linking supply to refineries via all the transportation paths, including imports and exports. And basically by maximizing the gate value for crude, we're predicting how crude should flow in the system. And so that's an, a meaningful um, tool that nothing else like that exists in the market. And we're gonna start, actually it goes live today. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of gathering um, implications there, a lot of users on the midstream side are beginning to use it. And then certainly if you're looking at Brent versus TI, there's a lot of interesting things there relative to imports uh, versus exports. The other main initiative we've got working on, or that we're working on, is related to greenhouse gases. And so that's what some of this is. And so basically taking EPA data, um, we started, this is the baseline data. So I'm going to show you 2018, but we're working on pulling this forward 2019 and then actually predicting it and even predicting it at an operator level. And so just for some frame of reference, when we're talking about oil and gas, um, you get emissions coming from production, but also from gathering. So the focus of this here, we're talking about production. So that's the focus of what I'm going to show you. Um, upstream emissions by play. So we tied emissions to the individual wells, and then of course, aggregated them up by play. And what you can see here generally is, um, if, if, when you look at all the dots, you can see basin by basin, and I'm going to show you some aggregate slides in a second. But you can see generally that very little emissions are coming from the dry gas plays. That makes sense. We're recovering the gas because it's a gas play. When you look at the oilier areas, something like 40% of emissions are coming from the oily areas and 10 to 40 um, in the liquids rich gas areas. But and again, again, we have the state at the operator level. We also have it at the play level. If you look at it by source, what's going on here? So you've got combustion equipment, pneumatic equipment, flaring and venting. Flaring is a big one, especially in places like the TMS, which has a higher uh, kilograms of CO2 per BOE of production. A lot of that coming from the, the flaring and venting. Uh, Bakken, a lot of flaring, right? A lot of orange. Central Basin platform in the Permian, a lot of a lot of orange. And so that's generally how to read this. You also get uh, greenhouse gas emissions from storage tanks, equipment leaks, completions and workover activity, compressors, and then other. Um, so one of the last slides here, I think just to highlight, it's interesting because when you look at where these emissions are coming from, this first column is showing you production as a percent, and this is BOE. And then we're showing you how much of those emissions are coming from this relative to that production level. And you can see, right, the Bakken represents about 8% of US supply, but 16% of, of emissions. On the flip side, you have the Marcellus, which is 16% of supply and only 4% of emissions. And so again, this is aggregate data really just to highlight what was happening in 2018. Uh, but we've got 2019 data and we're working on 
2020 and more predictive, where would we expect to see emissions going forward and even at the operator level? So some interesting things going on there. All right, we're a little bit over, so I'm gonna wrap up key takeaways very quickly. Crude prices have staged an impressive recovery. Like we know that, right? Sitting at $42. Why are we sitting there? Really because of very, very intentional supply management from OPEC, cutting out um, over 10 million barrels of supply, OPEC plus, when you include that, that additional 1.1 million barrels that came from Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Kuwait. And so that's really helped us fast track price recovery. Without that, we would still be oversupplied. We probably wouldn't be looking at pulling crude out of stocks until later this year. And so that supply management is certainly impactful and it's a big reason why prices have recovered this quickly. But if you look at where we're at today, are we gonna see another bump to 50 the rest of the year? Probably not. And a big part of that is around refinery, refinery margins. Refiners are not gonna ramp up utilization if there's nobody to sell those products to and if those margins stay tight and they are tight. Um, before last week's storage number, we were sitting at record levels of distal uh, stocks in the U.S., right? So we get some data points that are, that are okay, but the overall macro picture is we still have a lot of crude in storage, a lot of refined products in storage, and we have to have prices stay kind of where they're at or you risk bringing too much supply on too quickly and adding to stocks again, which is the last thing we need. So there's certainly some risk there still. Natural gas market um, remains bearish for the near term, but if you look at December pricing, we're trading above three bucks. We would tell you that next year average pricing needs to be between 350 and 390. And again, that's a result of less crude directed drilling, shut-ins, and really the fact that the gas market has been impacted, especially LNG, but not to the same level as crude. And it's actually recovering quicker than crude. And so we're gonna need a higher gas price really to, to balance that market. And then natural gas liquids, um, those prices have collapsed, Interesting things are happening there. The ethane market is staying very strong. So the pet chem market remains to be remains pretty strong, running 89, 90% utilization in the US, even through this downturn period. Um, C3, so propane took a hit. Uh, butane certainly took a hit because you use that for gasoline blending. And we didn't, we didn't have as much gasoline blending because gasoline demand was way off. And then natural gasoline certainly took a hit because of its use in pet chems and also as diluent and the fact that it competes with lighter crude streams. And so when crude, light crude streams collapse, natural gasoline prices collapse as well. Uh, but certainly look to those linkages will recover a bit, uh, not back up to historical levels quickly, but they will start recovering as soon as next year. All right, thank you very much. That was the content we had for you. I think we might have a minute or two for questions, but we're over on time. So Aaron, I'll let you jump in. Bernadette, thank you very much for, for all of that. Uh, I will ask you one question here, just as we as we had a number come in, I know you guys are gonna be available for one-on-ones throughout the conference, so I'll encourage folks, uh, if we don't get to your question, obviously we won't. Uh, schedule some time with Bernadette, but the, the one question I wanted to ask, uh, and, and it has to do with the price of oil, what are you guys seeing from a, a perspective on price of oil with potentially some inflationary effects on the U.S. dollar, and how does that go into your, your thoughts into uh, pricing? Sure, yeah. So I think if you look historically, certainly the value of the dollar has a direct impact on crude because you pay for crude cargos in U.S. dollars, right? And so generally that inverse relationship still holds true. Um, I would say that's also a part of what uh, effectively puts another ceiling on pricing, right? So when you look at these things, none of them are necessarily great news for higher prices from here, dramatically higher prices this year. Um, I do think that also what happens with the next round of stimulus, how does the market respond to that? What happens with the next election uh, or with the election? I think all of those things will directly impact crude markets. And so those are all additional risks that float out there. Um, not many are actually good news, I would say. Well, Bernadette, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. And I know that our next presenting company, uh, Comstock, will like your number of 390 uh, gas coming up. So uh, we will take the stage and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.